There we go. All right, folks. Well, let, let's go ahead and start. People uh, can can continue uh, trickling in. Um, before Dave goes over, we just have a couple of uh, uh, bookkeeping uh, items. Uh, the first thing is I want to remind you guys that uh, this is going to be recorded and will be posted on on the club website um, in, a, in a few days. So, uh, like like the usual warning, uh, don't say something you you might regret, <laughs> or don't tell a joke you might regret, Stan. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, uh, another uh, item is um, this will actually be the last uh, seminar of this winter. Um, Stan was originally going to do a seminar next week, but something came up and he won't be able to do it. So this is the, the final seminar. Um, and Dave Cleveland will be doing a, a safety seminar. So if, if you guys don't know, David is the... Uh, Utah Soaring Association safety officer. Um, he's a has been an avid glider pilot for for many years. Uh, he's been many of our instructors. <laughs> uh, he, he is a very prolific instructor, I'd say. Um, so uh, go ahead and, and start, Dave. Looking forward to it. Okay, thanks, Art. Thanks, and, and thanks again. I mean, you've gotten a lot of praise for these this series, and I'll tell you, it's well it's well well taken because uh, it's, it's really been great. Thanks to everybody who, who's joined in over the last month and a half, has it been? Yeah. Uh, really good stuff. Um, so we're starting into the, the season for this coming year. And there's a, uh, it's good to have a chance to, to go over some of the safety items that we can all think about. We're going to have a busier year this year than we had last. Last year, you know, the members who had their own ships did quite a bit of flying. Actually, to the, the number of toes that they did up at Elk Mountain and at Nephi, I didn't talk to uh, him or Dave Robinson, but it really wasn't that much off from the years previous. The club ships didn't get a lot of use. So as a result, uh, a lot of our club members didn't fly last year or they did um, very little fly. This year is going to be different. Uh, this year during the start of the season, during our spring checkouts, we're going to see a lot more rust than usual. We kind of have a double danger. Um, we have normal winter recess where people just haven't been flying all, all season. Then we have what, I, what I'm referring to as the COVID-related rust. rust. Um, so with the and with the lack of activity, there comes consequences. You know, when you first start flying this year, there's a, probably a little bit more of a false sense of ability. You know, we all kind of progress into the season slowly, which is good, but this year I'm going to ask everybody to take it even a little bit more slowly. Otherwise, you may get yourself into situations that you could have avoided. Maybe your personal minimums may not apply. The previous personal minimums you used they may, not, may not apply. There's an interesting process that goes on when, when you start to lose your skills. If you haven't practiced something, something for a while, what happens is, you know, as you start off flying, or in this case flying, uh, you're in normal situations, you feel pretty good. You feel a little rusty, but not too bad. But really, what ends up happening, though, is when you get into an abnormal situation, or if you get into a situation where there's a lot of stress, you know, you'll find your mental process has been a lot more convenient. Certainly, your mind isn't keeping up with the light of the day. I, I kind of refer to it as uh, micro memory loss, or mental process. You have short, small periods of forgetfulness. This gives you a kind of a perception of time compression. Dave? Yeah. We're, we're losing you a little bit on audio. I think you need to get closer to your mic. Uh, how about that? Sounds good. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, so this could cause some time pressure issues, which causes even further mental confusion. Think of the example of maybe uh, your first flight coming in for a landing and you're doing the fuel stall checklist and 
can't remember what the U means. Think about it, think about it. And then you start feeling a little rushed because you got other things to do, so you just give up on it. You don't need a checklist. That causes confusion and your skills degrade. Some, in some, some areas, they refer to this as de skilling. Uh, none of it's rocket science. We've all been there before. We talk about it. But here's something you may not have thought of. Because people study this stuff and they look at it. <laughs> you lose your mental skills faster than you lose your physical skills. So you may be flying well enough, but you're not processing the way that you used to. Think of it as a, if you look at a, a, a graph of cognitive versus motor skills, as you go out in time without practicing, your, your physical skills degrade, but your mental skills degrade even faster. Maybe an analogy, I used to ride bicycles a lot, as we were talking about in the uh, introduction previously. And uh, each year I'd go out the first flight of the season, and uh, I'd feel pretty good, pedaling well, shifting gears at the right time, all that stuff, staying upright. And then the minute I got into traffic, though, I realized I'd start getting frustrated because I wasn't able to maneuver or think about the traffic process. That was what was happening. Mental skills had degraded faster than my physical skills. So, get a good thorough spring checkout. I'd like to ask the instructors to do a couple of things. One is, I'd really like to see the instructors fly with other instructors this year for spring checkouts, especially if you didn't get to fly last year. A little bit. Uh, raise your personal minimums uh, and don't allow yourself to get distracted. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. But, uh, Maybe schedule your first couple of flights uh, when the airport isn't very busy. Really good idea. Before I go into the distraction part, uh, a little bit off topic, but it has to do with educating yourself as far as what happens to people when they're flying airplanes slash gliders. A lot of us use the NTSB database to mine the data reports, but there are actually three different databases you can look at to learn from what other people have learned. There's also YouTube videos, a um, huge amount of YouTube videos from instructors, well-known glider pilots, and even some discussions about glider accidents. It's pretty good. Back to the, uh, the NTSB database. Uh, it's, 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 it's a fabulous database. It's got a ton of information in it. The problem with the, with the NTSB database is that it's all green from incident reports that are required reporting reports from the NTSB. People don't voluntarily submit reports to the NTSB. So you don't really usually get incidents or slight degrade or degradations to flight safety. What you get are the really bad accidents where somebody gets killed, or seriously hurt, or big damage to the airplane property. So the database lacks a lot of incident uh, data where you can find and here's a, a picture. I don't know if anybody's been to the NTSB database webpage recently, but they've changed their, uh, their, their search page. Now it's referred to as CAROL, Case Analysis and Reporting Online. It's actually extremely robust. You just have to remember to, to go on the upper uh, menu and select Advanced Search before you start searching. That'll give you a lot more selections. Once you get used to it, it's a great great tool. The database that I use, I do a lot of my reading off of is the ASRS database, the Aviation Safety and Reporting System. I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with it. It's extremely robust. It's all voluntary. Sometimes it's, it's people kind of force voluntary because they, because part of the submissions are uh, an attempt to, to not be subject to certificate Usually that works, sometimes it doesn't. So it's all voluntary. The advantage of the ASRS database is that it, it, there is a portion of a report that is subjective, where the pilot will kind of say what happened and how he could have done, he or she could have done something to prevent it from happening. So it's, it's a very great database. Uh, this is an example of the, the uh, search page you can look at if you want to go ahead and mine for gliding accidents. The 
third database is um, the Soaring Safety Foundation. Believe it or not, they have a, uh, a database for incidents and accidents for climbers as well. It's all voluntary. It's not very well known. And as a, as a uh, result, there is not a lot of data in it or a lot of reports. I'd like to ask everybody, if you see something during your soaring day that causes you to think that soaring safety was degraded, go ahead and file a report with these guys. It's all voluntary. Uh, it's all anonymous. And everybody will benefit from it. Nobody's going to get hurt because you made a, a submission to the Soaring Safety Foundation on your shirt. Any questions so far? Any thoughts, comments? Okay. So the, the main thing I'd like to talk about is um, something I'd like everybody to think about this year when you're flying. And uh, if you can give me feedback on it throughout the year, that would be great. You can talk to each other about it. That would be great as well. Kind of builds on a short article I sent out uh, earlier this summer, or excuse me, this winter. And it has to do with distractions and how they reduce your safety margins. There's two reasons I'm bringing this up. And the first one is that all the evidence that the FAA, DOT, and even anecdotal evidence they, they take in shows an increasing problem with pilots, drivers, machinery operators. <coughs> All points towards an increasing problems with distractions. Now, this could be uh, the fact that we have more problem. We have more things that distract us: cell phones, iPads, things like that. That could be part of the problem. It could be that we're raising a generation of people that are easily distracted. <clears throat> Nobody knows, but the point is that it's it's real, and it's a it's a real serious problem. The second reason I'm talking about this is the fact that we had a very like, we had a fatal accident last uh, spring that was it's turning out to look like it was a direct cause of, of uh, glider pilot distraction. Tow pilot was killed out in California. Canopy came open, and uh, two seconds later, the tow plane was upset. The tow pilot died. One life was lost, and a whole bunch of people were impacted. Think, just think about the number of people that are impacted by that kind of an accident. Not only there's a person killed, but the poor guy flying the glider, the community at the large, everybody who saw it, family, friends, and then not to mention all the legal and insurance problems. So it's a real serious problem. There's three areas I'd like to talk about. Uh, they're called, one of them is the startle problem, surprise problems, and distractions. For distractions, uh, distractions and, and interruptions kind of can be used interchangeably. Not exactly the same, but for all practical purposes, they are. So first, I'll talk about the first two briefly, and then I'll go a little bit more in depth into distractions. Startle is a uh, we're familiar with it. It's an involuntary reflex. It's caused by something outside of us happening that basically scares us. Sudden exposure to intense stimulation. It has two components. There's the startle reflex, which is just purely physiological. Your shoulders hump, hunch up, your eyes blink. Uh, maybe you get a shot of adrenaline. It could, it would, it does cause a just a real, very short period of uh, immediate and substantial negative effects on your ability to perform even close motor skills. The second part of it is a uh, response, and that's a response to it. That's behavioral and psychological, basically task interruption and substantive mental impairment. It lasts a little bit longer than the reflex, 15 seconds to a minute. Of the three areas that I'm talking about tonight, uh, this is probably the least problematic of all three. It has a very minor impact on flight safety. The only time that it really does is if it, if it interrupts uh, fine motor skills for landing or maybe just rotating, starting to take off in a glider on a uh, on an arrow toe or a lurch lurch. Good examples are bird strikes or maybe in flight a really, really close near miss or perhaps a uh, potato chip bag blowing up behind your head <laughs> and uh, or maybe a lightning strike, something like that. They're impossible to prevent. 
and uh, mitigation is all after the fact. It just has to do with how well you reset your car. Where was I? What was I doing? <coughs> Second event has to do with surprise. Surprise events aren't as violent, uh, but they have the same same effects, uh, long term effects. This one has one of my favorite definitions. A cognitive emotional response to mismatches between mental expectations and perceptual responses in the actual environment. Back on the shores of Lake Minnetonka, we referred to these as WTF. This is something uh, that you're experiencing uh, that you didn't expect to experience, or vice versa, something that doesn't happen that you expect it to happen. Another glider appears in the pattern ahead of you. Deer crosses a runway in front of you on takeoff. Sudden moderate turbulence. <laughs> stall at low altitude, or hopefully not a spin. I mean, just you know, think about what your reaction would be if you stalled at low altitude. How would you respond? Uh, what would be your initial response? What would be your subsequent response? Your initial response would be as good as your training, because it would be all subconscious. Your secondary response, though, has to do with how well you're going to mentally process that whole situation that happened. I've seen it several times where. Somebody will unexpectedly stall at a ladder, or something happens they didn't expect. They just stop flying. Uh, it's very common to go into secondary stalls after initially after the primary stall. With both events, startles and surprises, uh, they have the same consequence: confusion, failure to act, acting improperly, interruption of a current task. The biggest question is, what do you do after? How to reset. I'll talk about that. So now the the, uh, the meat of the story: uh, distractions and interruption, interruptions. We talk about these all the time. Uh, it's something that we talk about at the glider port. We talk about it at home. I was distracted. This. I was distracted. That. There's a reason, though, that the FAA and the NTSB have listed distractions as being one of the primary causes for injury, uh, errors, and death in, in flights. Uh, think of distractions kind of as a general category and interruptions as a, as a form of a distraction. Because interruptions are just as bad. Of the three, Areas that we're talking about tonight, the distractions are the most prevalent. They're the easiest to control, the easiest to mitigate. If it's a if it's an interruption, uh, it may not be a hazard of your own doing, but it's easily managed, quite easily to do that. Systems training, procedure training, and all less effective these kind of events. There's two kinds of distractions. There's self-imposed, which are controllable. Example of a self-imposed uh, distraction would be programming onboard devices, taking pictures, changing radio frequencies, eating food, cell phone alerts, daydreaming. Then there's uncontrolled distractions, and that can't be controlled, obviously, but you can train yourself to recognize them and actively participate in mitigating the possible problems. And what we see the most often at the glider port is social interactions like Another one may be searching for other gliders that you that you hear about. Maybe around you, you start searching out the airplane, you get distracted from actually flying the glider. Same thing with altitude management, getting close to the terrain, thermally. You know, I'm sure all of us have stories about concentrating on the variometer and getting too slow. Another one, psychological needs would be either eating or having to pee. These can be very distracting. Distractions can be uh, subtle, they can be intrusive, they can be momentary, long-lasting. It's important to know that uh, they, they may cause um, detected or undetected errors. You may not even know you're being distracted. I don't know how many of you know about Eastern Airlines Flight 401. This was probably 40 years ago now. But there was an accident in the Everglades in Florida where an L-1011, three Highly trained Eastern Airlines professionals got fixated on a landing gear light bulb, uh, indicator light bulb, and when somebody leaned forward to try to, to put the light bulb back in the socket, they leaned against the control column, 
disconnected the autopilot and the airplane made a long, slow descent into the Everglades. About 101 people died because they were all fixated. Well, actually, one of them left the cockpit by that time. Two pilots fixated on, on a light bulb and 200 people died. So it has a, it has a serious impact. Obviously, the failures, the effects are failure to complete normal operations, checklists, maybe failure to complete your habitual actions, failure to monitor, monitor communicate, follow through your plans, fly the glider, getting to do an action, letting the glider fly you, not vice versa, and leaving uncertainties unresolved. All big issues. The result is mistaking a speed brake handle for a uh, gear handle, mistaking the toe release handle for the flat handle, failure to use the speed brakes on landing, not tuning the radio correctly, not putting the gear down, not bringing it up. How many times have you forgotten to bring the gear up? There's a reason that distractions and interruptions have such an effect on aviation safety. They really do. Uh, they decrease cognitive capacity, they reduce the ability to perform complex tasks, Temptation to, to multitask comes into play. Your mental processing becomes confused. Sequencing errors, those are errors where you start doing things out of, out of sequence, obviously. Secondary issue, and the biggest one that, that, one of the big ones that comes into play is an erroneous time perception. That means that once you get distracted, you start trying to recover, you get this feeling that, that you need to rush things. Time crunch there causes poor execution and selection. What do we do? How do we mitigate the problems? Well, try to manage the number of distractions first off. Use low workload times to kind of complete the controllable actions. Get the AWOS weather information while you're at altitude, even if you're not planning at landing at the airport you're flying over. Formulate what if plans. Stick, stick to personal habits and procedures. Keep loose items away from the cockpit. I was watching a video the other day on, the, on YouTube about a guy who crashes, and uh, he, he's got stuff all over the place in the cockpit. It's all getting in the way while it's trying to land in the field. It's just loose items can really be very distracting. Radio chatter, and obviously cameras and cell phones. The other thing to think about is, is um, that you could be the source of distraction to other people. You know, if you see a friend of yours that's doing pre-flight or, or getting ready to launch, haven't talked to them for a while, take a while. You know, give, give it a rest. Wait till they come back. Don't interrupt them while they're getting ready to fly their glider. That's a, that's a big source of distraction for others. The other thing we could do is, is uh, for you instructors out there, you know, introduce Several surprise and distractions in your training curriculum. I know some of you do. Um, uh, John did a great job the other day during one of the one of the events. He was flying with a guy, and and the guy came back later on and gave me some actually some really positive feedback. He was glad the way that John handled it. John was yakking away and got him involved in the conversation and pulled the release. And completely surprised him. Very distracted. He said it was it was really good. Uh, it was a really good effect. So how do we minimize the impact of these events? What do we do? What's the resolution? They're all basically about the same. First of all, try to identify what you were doing. Where was I interrupted? What should I do to get back on track? This, this seems really elemental. I know it does. I really do. But in the heat of the moment, it doesn't. It's important to take a specific calibrated response. Think very slowly, very clear, clearly about it. Identify what your process was and how you were interrupted. Then get back on track. Think about what you may have skipped or missed. Also, aviate, navigate, communicate. We use that as a guideline all the time. Sorry. Another way to think about it is take time to make time. I don't know if you've heard this saying before, but uh, it's it's so one that I use all the time. In a glider, especially a glider, nothing happens fast. It really doesn't. If, if you need to rush in a glider, you can sleep it. No gap. Don't rush. Take your time. 
avoid that. Remember, one of the consequences of being startled, surprised, and distracted is that you feel like you got to get things done. You got to get caught up. You'll get caught up. Just take your time. If it's a really, really uh, serious situation, level the wings, close the air brakes, put the nose on the horizon, and start to think about your situation. Turn back towards landable terrain when you're Take care of those issues and you're going to be fine. So in summary, uh, understand the effects of distractions and, and interruptions. They're subtle, short in the long term. I understand that you have control over some of them, not all of them. Reduce the, um, reduce the ones you can control and mitigate the ones you can't. It's a conscious, deliberative process, and if necessary, uh, verbalize it. And always navigate, navigate, communicate, slow down when something happens, and absolutely critical, verify. Make sure that when you think you have accomplished something, verify it. Tactically, verbally, however you need to, make sure you get it done. So how to have a safe sorting season? Be aware of disruptive events. Minimize distractions. Properly deal with interruptions. Understand the effects of, the, of those interruptions. <coughs> There's another way to increase your safety, and that's to expand your abilities. I'm going to divert a little bit here. This is the last subject, so bear with me. Uh, uh, there's a good way to increase your skills and actually help you improve your ability to deal with distractions. How do you expand your abilities? Think about this. Um, history, research, studies have all shown that accidents and incidents are not caused by unskilled pilots. The, these accidents and incidents and just the nasty whittling away at safety are, are not caused by people that don't know how to fly. They're caused by people who are not practicing good judgment. They're not thinking properly. Safe handling, safe flying is not about how well you handle the glider. Obviously, practice, you know, practicing the skill makes you safer. It's a big, big part of it. You need to know the location. You need to know the club glider, your favorite local site, local flyers. It all makes you more able to anticipate, plan, and fly safely. But the foundation of safety is not how well you manipulate the controls, most important part of flying safety is how well you make decisions. Decisions keep you out of trouble. Decisions get you into trouble. Make good decisions. You have to gain experience. And that's a variety of experience. We've all heard the phrase, good judgment is a result of experience, and experience is the result of bad judgment. It's a cute quote, and I like it. It's certainly true, but improving your judgment doesn't have to come from bad judgment. How do you gain more experience? Well, try different things. Get different experiences. Believe it or not, there are ways to get uh, more experiences without bad judgment. New experiences will give you a wider understanding of what sewing is all about. Your mental process will, will improve. You'll be able to adapt your knowledge to unfamiliar cir circumstances. It's interesting because it, it happens very early on in a person's flying career. Moving out of their comfort zone makes them a better pilot. How do you gain experience? How do you get better judgment? Fly with other people. Fly with a variety of instructors. Don't just fly with your favorite instructor. Fly with your friends. Fly with strangers. Strangers are even better. Go to other, other sites. We just uh, had four fabulous presentations showing the great soaring sites at our disposal. There's, there's really, literally, there's no other club in the world that has the same opportunity. We can, we can experience soaring in four different locations. They're all really close to each other. Get a local checkout. Uh, even flying with just somebody that's a, a local pilot that's familiar with the area is a good, good, good idea. Go fly cross country. Work on your SSA badges, the, the, uh, the bronze, gold, diamond, and uh, Dan Thurkle brought up in, in his presentation about Morgan County to go fly triangles around your, um, your local airport. Successfully larger triangles. Great experience. Do, do a follow me flight with a, with a local pilot. Those are their 
all of these can help expand your abilities and uh, make you a much safer pilot. That's it. About a half an hour. Um, go and have a fun season. Keep it safe. Expand your abilities. Try something new. You've got to, you, I'm, I'm just constantly amazed at the, the wealth of experience and knowledge we have in our club members. It's fantastic. We have four fabulous airports to fly out of. Take advantage of all of them. And I'm done. Any questions or comments? I have a couple questions, Dave. Sure. So you talked about um, sort of being methodical in your recovery. Like, what was I doing? Can you go back to that uh, page? Oh, sure. Um, you said, what was I doing? And, uh, and those other questions that you were asking yourself. Um, Right. Okay. So, and then you, and then you later said, "Take your time to recover, yes. uh, to get back on track." Is this basically how you're taking your time to get back on track? Is to ask yourself those questions? Absolutely. You bet. Yeah. <laughs> and is it's there really, any way? Go ahead. Oh, uh, really? The the, the, the time factor that uh, I talked about a little bit earlier, that, that feeling of being rushed, or maybe even being rushed. I mean, sometimes people try to rush you. But, but being rushed is probably one of the biggest killers that we have in aviation. You really never have to go fast. If you, if, if you proceed at a methodical pace, don't rush yourself. Your mind works better. You think more clearly. You can decide and act uh, in a better problem, a better fashion. So, is there any way to? I mean, do you practice this in some way? Because uh -huh. those startles and surprises, we can't really uh, manufacture. That uh, I do practice, and and there's a couple of sayings, a couple of things I used to do. This this kind of goes back to my job, which. Uh, but but uh, there's one saying that you know when the engine blows up, why'd you watch? Uh, or if you've got multiple lights flashing, uh, you know above your head, sit on one hand. <laughs> and you can do the same thing in the cockpit. You, know, you can if, if something happens, like if a canopy starts to rumble, just take your take one hand and put it underneath your leg, and then sit, and look, and think about what you're going to do next. Thanks. Yep. So the, the recent the critical piece of this, right? Okay. This is what all of our instructors are teaching our students is at some point, if something unexpected happens and you have uh, the ability to see, uh, perceive and understand what is happening and then uh, deal with it, you still have to keep, you still have to continue the flight, right? So the reset is probably the most important piece of this. It is, yeah. So what, where am I? What, what was I doing when this unexpected event happened? Yep. And now how do I continue out of this? And, and, and you know, I, when we're teaching our students, the instructors in the club, we do this all the time, right? But for you experienced glider pilots, um, it probably doesn't happen all that often. It, 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 uh, it probably doesn't happen as, as often because you can you may see uh, situations developing faster or more more widely but I would I would push back a little bit in that the, the issue is is what happens when you're distracted or interrupted and you, and you don't do something that you thought you had done. And that's where you have. That's where the reset comes from. That's where you have to step back and you know, question yourself. What did I do? How do I move forward safely? What did I forget to? That sort of. But I. But yeah, you're absolutely right, Chris. Hey, Dave. This is Paul. Uh huh. 
I just have to throw in. There's got to be a joke in here someplace. I've <laughs> <laughs> been waiting all night. Stop the tape. <laughs> all right. So you know, what the janitor said when he jumped out of the closet. Supplies. Oh yeah, yeah. That was on. A, that was on an old. Uh, who was that guy? Uh, it was, a, it was in a movie, yes. <laughs> the other thing is, is you know, my wife Beth Ann that flies a little clipper, she brings up a good point. And she always talks about to be smooth is slow. Yes. And to be slow then in smoothness is to be fast. So That's take right. your time. It's like you're just rephrasing what you've just said. Take your time, take a breath, be smooth in what you're doing. And then take action after that. And, and that's yep. Slow is fast. Fast is slow. Yep. Dave, this is Adam. Yeah. Um, thanks for mentioning that uh, incident reporting on the Soaring Safety Foundation website. It is underutilized. Yeah. Um, and there is some decent information in there, but it could be much better if it was well known and people actually used it. And then. I was going to mention that there's the old book, Soaring Accidents That Almost Happened. That's a pretty good read um, that I have a lot of copies of if somebody wants to borrow one at some point in time. And then also take a read of the Soaring Safety Foundation uh, accident annual accident report that will be coming out soon. I think the summary will be in Soaring soon, but you can go to the website and read the current report and the past reports. Um, for a pretty decent analysis of glider-specific accidents. That's good, Gosh. Thank you. Awesome. So, Are, Dave, any other questions? Dave, go, go ahead. Dave. Yeah, I have, yeah, Dave. You mentioned the the uh, NTSB and the and the SSA. What was the third one you mentioned? Oh, uh, start. Yeah, ASRS. ASRS. And what's the difference between that and the NTSB? The, um, the NTSB database is driven and filled with reports that the NTSB has required people to submit. And the only time the NTSB will require you to submit a report is basically uh, somebody gets severely injured or killed, uh, an aircraft is severely damaged or property, somebody else's property is damaged as well, more than $25,000. Then they'll ask you to, then, they, then, then you're required to make a report. Sometimes they'll ask you to make a report on an incident that affects flight safety, but they're just, if you, if you go to the NTSB uh, database and you look for incidents, lighter incidents, I think you'll get one in the last 10 years. It's just, they don't have much in there. Where the ASRS uh, website benefits is that these are these are reports that are driven by people who voluntarily submit a report, and by by definition, really, they're almost all incidents and not accidents. And you also get a subjective uh, subjective input from the pilot. I could have prevented this if I had done this, or this is what I think happened. This is why I think it happened. It's, it's a much more personal uh, report, and a link to that is on the safety page of our, of our club website. Dave, can you hear me okay? Uh -huh. To follow up with that, I was trying to look for John Weber's accident information, see if there's any update. I couldn't find anything on the web. Um, so where would I go to, to look for that? Would you mind kind of showing us? Because I couldn't find the accident report at all or anything or any updates. Sure. If you want to bear with my... If you don't mind. Second here. So you're what doing I did that, with, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, while Dave's doing that, I'll just kind of let you guys know about the report from last year in the Soaring Safety Foundation. You know, we had eight fatal accidents in the glider community last year that caused nine fatalities. And then we had a, a number, I think like maybe 17 more accidents that caused injuries ranging from serious to minor.
the accident would have occurred if you even want to do a date search july the first of 2019. let me just try a this uh have any of you guys use this carol query page yeah so so the challenge here is if it happened earlier it's the line is right there it's five lines yeah. down it says for right. investigation 408 use the, the old database exactly uh, so this was what date was it we'll say july 1st Some of these are open for years. Yeah, they, they, they never come to a conclusion. Um, it's just the objective facts that they can get, and that's it sometimes. And yeah, and Chris, I couldn't even get to this, but this was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, the, you're, and you're right, Chris. Uh, they say, especially, you know, I, we're not being picked on, of course, but the glider community accidents and even death in the glider community, uh, it affects the community tremendously. It's not something that the NTSB spends a lot of time on. Uh, unless, though, you know, the other one that I, that, uh, when was, uh, when was um, Dave Nadler's accident? That would have been... fourteen. Previous year, wasn't it? No, no, no. That would have been um, either. I don't think it was eighteen. I think it was two thousand seventeen. I, th I think it was too. Try zero six seventeen. You can also just sort by Utah and Glider, and you'll see them all. Good point. State. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to offend anybody there. There's, there it is. No? Nope. That was the second one from the bottom. So, so that one is still in work. Yeah, and I would expect that one to be in work forever. It's not ever going to be resolved in any way whatsoever. If, if uh, I, I was actually, I was, I had the opportunity to listen to, we've all heard Dave talk about it at the different events, but I was actually able to, to hear the, his co-pilot talk about it, the kid who was sitting in the back seat. And boy, I'll tell you what, what, a, what an individual. He did a, he did a fabulous job. He really did. There you go. Hey, thanks for showing. Yep. Awesome. Any other questions, folks? I was just going to mention that, uh, you know, from the NTSB, the last couple of years, we've seen an increased um, desire by them to reach out to the Soaring Safety Foundation to assist with glider accident investigation. Was that right? Yeah, which I think is a good thing because their glider knowledge is very limited. Yeah. There's another comment I would like to make. I really like David's uh, presentation because it really talks about kind of people responding uh, to different types of events. So I think that's kind of one piece in it. I think another component to it is really and it's partly embedded in some of what David said, uh, but partly could also I would like to bring it up is the precursors. Uh, the precursors for all of these different situations. And um, <clears throat> when I talk about some of these issues in other contexts, um, there are a couple of things that are important. And David mentioned Russia. Before you go too far, you may have your microphone right up your mouth because you're really overdriving the volume. You can back up. Okay. Is that better? That is better. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Dan. So, um, the precursors, cognitively speaking, so in terms of mindsets, what's driving us when we are not up to performance. And so this is not so much about going into the season, but even during the season. So one of the things David mentioned, and it stuck with me because he was the person who brought it up, the one is running and aviation. So really rushing is a very, very bad situation. If you catch yourself rushing, stop yourself. Another one is frustration, when you're frustrated. So during launch, something went wrong, or you're not catching the first thermal and all of this. That sets you up for failure if you don't get over this level of frustration. Fatigue, we all know that. And of course, there's kind of guidelines out on when you should and shouldn't fly. So being fatigued, being stressed out about external factors that are not related to flying, you know, all of the domestic stuff that may go on, go on with you, the uh, issues um, related to work, for example. So if you go out and you want to fly and want to relax and you have a lot of burden being stressed, that's an issue. But the last one, which is really the most difficult to understand and to catch yourself in is complacency. And we are all, you know, more or less complacent to um, kind of the ways we are doing things. And sometimes the old ways just don't work. And to identify that is really important. So these are often referred to as traps and triggers. So they create a mindset, cognitive mindset that leads you to failure. So you are not noticing things. And they've talked about all of that. But I think I thought it would be in interesting to bring up those things as well. Excellent. Thanks, Frank. And, and for, for you and guys you know, who don't I know, uh, Frank, Frank is a FAA. Frank is a Go professor ahead, who studies that. Uh, that. That's his research subject. So he would be an expert in this. So th thanks for contributing that, Frank. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, that all plays into the, uh, the platitudes that we hate from the FAA, but their PAVE model, I think, is something they've done quite well. You know, the pilot, the aircraft, the environment, and external factors, external pressures that you might have. Um, and my, I did my first uh, uh, rehack for my CFI, um, because I haven't been a CFI long, and, and the the whole PAVE thing resonates very well with the students, but do do we ever bring that up with an experienced pilot who's doing hey, the Hey, Frank, Frank, mute your, uh, mute your mic, Frank Drews, please. Do we ever bring up the, the whole PAVE concept with the experienced pilots that we're doing spring checkouts with? Um, I think that's a, a pretty good tool. I, you know, Chris, I, yeah, I agree. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because there's a whole litany of acronyms that the CFIs learn when they're getting their ratings. And that's the one that stuck with me over the years. It's the one that we use with our students. And to follow on with kind of what you're alluding to, though, is that, you know, if you look at the data, it's, it's not the inexperienced pilots that are having problems. It's the experienced pilots. Those are the ones that are causing the accidents. Those are the ones that are getting complacent, taking higher risks, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think that's a great suggestion to bring that up during flight reviews or, or spring checkouts. Absolutely. Awesome. Excellent discussion, folks. Yep. I, I think this is uh, um, human factors are a major source of accidents in the glider community. Um, much more so than our equipment, unfortunately. You know, we, we are the, the weakest link in, in this safety system. So, um, Dave, thank you very much for, for your presentation. And um, I think that's gonna, uh, unless there's other comments or, or things that people really wanna get out, I think this will probably wrap up uh, the seminar series for the winter. Um, I wanna thank Tim Taylor, uh, Paul Schneidler, uh, Dan Thurkel, Lynn Alley, Bruno Vassell, and Dave Kluven. Um, Thank you very much for your contributions to these seminars. Uh, they've, been, they've been absolutely outstanding. Um, for you guys who don't know, uh, this stuff is all on the website. And uh, it, it's, it's a great resource to look back and, and see this stuff, even in the middle of the soaring season. So, um, guys, thank you very much for your contributions. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Art.
Thank you for putting this all together and persisting, Billy. Excuse me. Here, here, here. Good job. So we have 80 members in the club, and I've participated in all five of these so far, and I'm a little disappointed that we didn't have more participation. The participants here are all super experienced. Uh, they're all super experienced participants. Um, so we need, I think, probably to work a little bit on the, the uh, reaching out to get more, more of our club members at large. Involved in these sort of things. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. In, in all things club related. Yeah. yeah. It's always, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, with that, folks, let, let's go ahead and, and, and sign off. And uh, looking forward to seeing all you guys at the glider port and, and uh, fly safe. See ya. Thank you, Bye -bye. See you later. Thanks.